ladies and gentlemen, our program has now begun. Please welcome Joe Irizarry, Chair-elect, North San Antonio Chamber, and Andrew Hunt, the North San Antonio Chamber's Infrastructure Chair. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, North San Antonio Chamber members, our partners, and our distinguished guests today. I'm Joe Lazari. I'm Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer of Robert Kistner. I also serve on the North San Antonio Chamber Executive Council, and I'm the Chair-Elect, and I welcome you to our event today. Uh, for starters, please help me to thank our partners and title sponsor, CPS Energy. How about a round of applause for CPS Energy? We'd also like to thank our premier sponsor, Binkley and Barfield DCCM. Round of applause, please. And lastly, let's thank our event sponsor, San Antonio Water System. How about a round of applause for them? Thank you, Sauce. I'd also like to recognize some distinguished guests today. You're all distinguished guests but we're gonna call out a few specifically. So let's start with the city of Castle Hills. We have the Honorable Mayor, uh, J.R. Trevino. <laughs> the Bear County Commissioner, Precinct One, Rebecca Clay Flores. Thank you for being here. Bear County Commissioner, Precinct Three, Grant Moody. Grant. City of San Antonio Councilman, District 8, Manny Pelaez. Manny? We have, we have two more from CPS Energy, a chair of the board, Janie Martinez Gonzalez. Janie. And CPS Energy's vice chair, Francine Romero. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm excited to be here to welcome you and to open our State of Energy event uh, with my colleague, Andrew Hunt, uh, who's Senior Vice President of Project Control. Andrew also serves on the Executive Council for the San North San Antonio Chamber and is the Chair of the Infrastructure Council, which is the host for today's event. So with that, I want to bring Andrew up to the floor to let us know how we got to this uh, place and to this special program. Andrew Hunt. Thank you, Joe. Good. Thank you, Joe. Good job. Started on time. We're good. Um, the North San Antonio Chambers uh, Infrastructure Council is committed to bringing fresh and unique discussions and speakers to our monthly meetings for our members. But also beyond that monthly uh, meeting, we think it's also important to bring these topics to a broader audience. And we truly believe that that's what we've done here today. With a, from the bottom of my heart, with a lot of gratitude, thank you for coming today. I think this is an electric, it's gonna be an electric presentation. I feel the, inner, I've got more where that came from. We've had a long-standing uh, relationship, long-standing partnership, and we've done many valuable programs featuring CPS Energy uh, over the years. It's always been a wonderful relationship, bringing in reader, uh, leaders like Rudy to discuss various aspects of their mission. This year, we wanted to expand the reach and invite Irk Kotz, newly appointed CEO of President Pablo Vegas. You're going to hear a lot more about him and from him in a minute, in hopes to gain a better understanding of how the two organizations work together uh, and how they serve San Antonio, the community, the economic region, and our great state. For this important discussion, we couldn't think of anyone better than to bring in a leading policy influencer to moderate this discussion. The Texas 2036 Executive Vice President, A.J. Rodriguez. There he is. You start coming up. I've got 14 more pages that you wrote. Uh, we are proud to say that A.J. is our San Antonio homegrown, homegrown boy, and he has deservedly catapulted. That sounds kind of exciting. He was catapulted into leadership roles, having served in the local public sector here, nonprofit chamber, including your very own North San Antonio Chamber, and corporate worlds. AJ, thank you for being here. I hand off things to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrew. Give him a round of applause, please. So it's, it's my pleasure to be back home. We've uh, day 60 or 72 of the legislative session. We got 68 more to go. And uh, I uh, work for Texas 2036. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan 
public policy shop that's focused on ensuring that Texas remains the best place to live and work through our bicentennial and beyond. And I can't tell you what a pleasure it is and what an honor it is to be here with these other, other two gentlemen who I'm gonna call up here shortly. Uh, before I do, I wanna take a point of privilege and just uh, congratulate the North Chamber for its excellent leadership choice in Dwayne Wilson. And uh, also, uh, I cut my teeth in chamber work back in 1997 here in San Antonio, and one of my mentors is in the audience, Joe Cryer. So I just want to give both of those gentlemen a round of applause. I get to do that as the moderator. So with that, let me welcome Rudy Garza up to the stage. And uh, while, he's, while he's coming up, I'm going to go ahead and introduce him. I've known Rudy for quite some time, ever since TXU Energy, uh, over at uh, when he was in Corpus. Uh, he's the president and CEO for CPS Energy, the nation's largest municipally owned electric and natural gas utility. He brings more than 25 years of experience serving in the electric and natural gas utility business. He, uh, he also uh, in the public and private sectors, and he's the first Hispanic leader to hold this position. Rudy has a BS in electrical engineering from the UT Austin and also an MBA from the University of North Texas. So uh, you, the rest of his story is in the program, uh, as is with other, everyone else. So we're going to cut this down. As I mentioned earlier, don't read the bio that my mama wrote me, wrote for me. So uh, let's give Rudy a round of applause. I'm also uh, very happy and honored to introduce my, my new friend to you, Pablo Vegas. Pablo recently joined ERCOT in October 2022 as president and CEO. He's got a long history of service in both the electric and gas industries. He's previously served as executive vice president of NYSource and group president of NYSource Utilities overseeing electric and gas business segments. Prior to NYSource, he held other senior executive positions with AEP, American Electric Power, including president and CEO of AEP Ohio and AEP Texas. He's also held senior leadership positions with Fortune 500 companies, attended ma management, and leadership positions as well at the Harvard Business School and Ohio State University. And he graduated cum laude with a BS in mechanical engineering from the University of Michigan. Again, you can find more of Pablo's background inside the program. So with that, let's give Pablo a big welcome to San Antonio. Thank you. It is Pablo. <laughs> Great to see you. So thank you both. Let's, as my, my wife said, let's just par get this party started. Put the energy in energy and trying to riff <laughs> off some of the dad jokes over here. So uh, we're not thinking about the grid at night. Talk to us a little bit. Are, you're, are you not thinking about the grid at night all night? All, all night. So when you're not doing that, what do you look forward to enjoying? Let's do a little bit of an icebreaker. So I, I, I dream about the grid, AJ. I dream about <laughs> it all course. day, all night. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of actually relocating down to Texas. I, first thing I realized is I, I need to get some cowboy boots. So that's, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm clearly falling short on that front. But, but I want to first thank you for the invitation uh, to join you today. I'm super excited to have this conversation with you. There's so many interesting things going on in the electric industry. And it's just great to talk with an interested group of uh, professionals that understand how important the electric economy is to the growth of our state. So it's great to be here. Great to be here with uh, an old friend Rudy and I have known each other for over about 15 years. We both share time working together uh, down in Corpus Christi and just an incredible leader for this utility here uh, in San Antonio. CPS is blessed to have his skills and his talents. So it's a real privilege to be here with, uh, with both of you. So as I said, I'm relocating down here. And so in my spare time, I've got, a, I've got a freshman in high school, a freshman in college, and a recent college graduate. So trying to figure out you know, how, what's going on in their world, the sports, the, the homework, everything in between, uh, two girls, one boy. It is every waking minute in between uh, work, trying to make sure that they have everything they need, support from dad, figure out where my son's gonna go to school when he comes here, where we're gonna live. We're getting that all worked out here, and uh, so super excited to get the, the family down here and starting to see what a wonderful place Texas is. Um, and so that's, that's what's filling my nights these days, when I'm not thinking, dreaming about the grid. <laughs> of course, almost every hour on the almost hour. Almost every right? hour on the hour. Well, Talk to us, Rudy. Well, uh, let me start off by thanking Pablo for, for coming to San Antonio today. Uh, with the legislature in, tomorrow is a big day, which I'm sure we'll get into. A lot of bills uh, in Senate Business and Commerce, which he'll be uh, testifying at. But 
uh, he gladly uh, and, and uh, you know, accepted our invitation here. And so, Pablo, thank you. I know you got a lot to worry about. Uh, I, it's a big job, and I'm glad you're in it. Let, let me put it that way. Um, when I am not thinking about uh, our grid and our natural gas system, uh, you will find me uh, making the trek up and down 35 to go see my son at TCU in Fort Worth uh, and dealing with the trash talk of, uh, that I have to deal with from him you know, every time TCU beats Texas, which is a lot uh, here recently. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time up in the DFW area with him, uh, chasing my senior here in San Antonio, uh, high school senior around. Uh, so he's playing, you know, after he finished football, he's playing lacrosse. And, you know, I don't know where the heck that came from. But uh, and so now I'm having to deal with lacrosse uh, games. And when I'm not doing that, uh, I am two hours uh, front door to gate to uh, my dear lease, which I spend a lot of time at. And I'm two hours uh, from uh, to my favorite fishing hole down in Corpus Christi. So uh, if I am not with my family, I'm typically with them doing doing that. So Great, Gritty. Uh, why don't we continue with you? Just give us like the brief state of the state for CPS right now and, sure. and some background, then we'll go over to Pablo as well. I, I think we have a few slides uh, that I'm just gonna uh, kind of run through. Let me start off by uh, my chair and vice chair, uh, Janie Gonzalez and Dr. Francino Romero are here today. Uh, and I want to give them uh, and the, the entirety of our board credit. Uh, we are really rolling up our sleeves and uh, doing the work that we need to do to take this utility uh, into the future. And so uh, I would tell you that we're, we're at the beginning of a very strong period of investment uh, in our systems. Um, I think you're gonna see consistency from year to year over the next five years, uh, bringing our grid up to, uh, you know, to, to kind of into the future, uh, investing in our people, uh, doing the things that we have to do in our technology. We have a 22 year old, uh, you know, computer system. We're, we're, we're running the equivalent of Windows 2000. And as you can see with Southwest Airlines uh, over the holidays, when you have old systems, uh, you know, it presents risk. And so we got to get those systems upgraded so we can give all our customers uh, the, the optionality uh, that, that they're asking for. Uh, and so you're going to see us really focused in on, 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 uh, on prioritizing those investments, talking to our community about the support we'll need uh, to make those investments. Uh, but, but that's really where we are uh, today and where we're going to be over the next five years. Uh, can you, we flip over to the next slide? So this is really a look back at last year. And as you can see, you know, San Antonio is one of the fastest growing metropolitan communities uh, in the country. Certainly the biggest and fastest growing uh, metropolitan area in the state of Texas. And so we have to plan for the growth that we know is coming. Austin is tapped out. You know, Austin can't, they're growing vertically because they can't grow horizontally anymore. That is not the situation uh, that San Antonio is in. So, um, so when you talk about things like reclosures and all that is, is it's a smart switch that allows us to segment our system in a way that allows us to get our customers back on when we quickly, when we do have uh, challenges. We're making those investments. We, we made a, a ton of progress uh, last year. We're focused on the things that are gonna ensure reliability, which you have told us is most important to you. Uh, and so I'm really proud of the work that, that, uh, that our team did uh, you know, last year. So, uh, and I think we have another slide. And if you look at um, you know, kind of, uh, of where we're going, um, last year, or, or excuse me, earlier this year, uh, the board, uh, you know, thoughtfully decided on what the future of the next five to eight years of our generation strategy is. Uh, we thought we, we completed things like the Flex Power Bundle. Right before this meeting, uh, I was able to meet with the company that's going to build our 50 megawatt battery storage project down at, at our Spruce location on Calaveras Lake. That is a huge step forward. That makes our solar assets much more uh, 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 valuable because now we'll be able to extend that solar peak into the evening when Pablo needs to, need, you know, needs to worry about how we're going to, you know, we're going to uh, uh, replace those those solar that solar capacity once it starts, you know, falling off. So um, CPS Energy is making smart investments in our future, and uh, we're doing that by talking to our customers. Uh, we're doing that by you know giving our board options so that they can make um, you know informed decisions and working with our with our our, our uh, independent system operator in ERCOT uh, to ensure that you know, we make it all work. You know, all it's a very complex system 
that has to be balanced in real time to ensure that as our, our state grows, that we have the capacity we need uh, you know, to serve that load. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. And Pablo, you know, Texas has 29 million people. You're responsible for ensuring the reliability of power to 26 million of those 29 million. That's right. So talk to us a little bit about the state of the state for ERCOT and where we're at. So let me start with a little bit of kind of what ERCOT is, because a lot of, in the last couple of years, people have heard more about ERCOT probably they, than they have in the 20 years prior to that. And one of our unstated goals is to uh, make ERCOT uh, invisible again, because it, really <laughs> nobody should worry about ERCOT. And, and for, for, since the start really of the, of the market that we operate today, it has worked very seamlessly and uh, has not really been a, an issue. But um, so, so we serve 26 million uh, Texans. We cover about 90% of the electric load across the state of Texas. The Texas grid is unique from other grids in the country in that it's an isolated grid. Texas is like an electric island. And the United States is made up of essentially three very large connected grids, one on the west, one in the east, and Texas. And being independent and being isolated gives us the kinds of flexibility and independence to essentially decide how to run and operate this electric grid the way Texas wants to do it, and to make changes at a pace that would be impossible to do in other parts of the country where the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, has the obligation to weigh in and approve changes that go on anywhere else in the country. Here, the state legislature in Texas oversees all of the decisions on how the electric grid operates. And so it has a lot more nimbleness, has a lot more agility, and we see the benefit of that in terms of how we operate the grid. ERCOT's responsible essentially for really four key functions. Making sure that the grid is reliable, that the grid is cost effective, that it is open and accessible to anybody who wants to connect into it, and we're also responsible for retail competitive choice support. And that's kind of unique in Texas. Most other grid operators don't have anything to do with retail operations. But here in Texas, the ERCOT, we do manage the uh, retail switching. And so those are the four core functions of what ERCOT does. We don't own any generation. We don't own any transmission. We don't own any distribution. We don't own any of the infrastructure that actually is utilized to make or transmit electricity. But we oversee the operations of it. And an example of that, uh, an analogy that I heard that I thought was pretty good is we're kind of like Uber, where Uber is a technology platform that pairs up drivers. And in this, in this analogy, the drivers would be generation providers with riders. And riders in our world would be the consumers of electricity. And they match up through a technology platform the consumers that need a ride. And when there is a shortage of drivers, what happens? You see surge pricing. Prices go up to incentivize more drivers coming onto the system to make sure there's enough supply for the riders who want to use Uber. And we're kind of like that. We, we work a, we're a technology company. We essentially match up in real time generation supply to consumers, make sure that there's always enough of both, and we manage the operation of the market and the grid to ensure that continues to happen. It's a little bit more to it than that, but, that, but basically that's what ERCOT does. And since the, the, the winter storm year over the last two years, there's been a tremendous amount of changes that have occurred all the way from the inside of ERCOT, meaning how we're governed, through how we operate, the operational practices that we have, as well as some of the rules in the overall electric market. And we'll get into some of that as we talk about some of the more specific issues within, uh, within Texas. But that's a little bit about ERCOT, a little bit what, yes. about what we do and, uh, and what we're about. Well, Pablo, let's go ahead and launch into that anyway in terms of Talk to us specifically about some of the weatherization, some of the reliability measures that have been taken uh, in preparation for these extreme weather events that we've exp experienced, including these last two winter storms that we had. Yeah, so, you know, these last two winter storms were quite a, an interesting way to come into the organization and learn about, you know, what, what, what ERCOT is doing and, and how it's done what it's done. And I'm on a big learning curve myself. Um, and so we're, I'm continuing to, to appreciate the, uh, the incredible people and, and, uh, and, and resources that we have available to, to operate this complex electric grid. But the, the first winter storm that, that we experienced was Winter Storm Elliott. That was a storm that came through on the Wednesday before Christmas. If you recall, we had that incredible drop in temperature. It was very moderate, 
nice, you know, 50 degree, 40 degree kind of day, that drop down into the low teens or single digits, depending where in Texas you were, and created an extreme stress in terms of cold across the entire state of Texas. And, um, and so that had its own characteristics that were challenging to deal with. And, and to contrast that, we had Winter Storm Mara. Winter Storm Mara is the one that occurred January 31st, February 1st, right at the beginning of February, with all of the ice that came through. So first I want to acknowledge, you know, that the, the, the second storm caused a lot of outages across the state. And so I think in San Antonio, you all were a little bit uh, better positioned in terms of the impact of Winter Storm Mara. But other parts of the state, from Austin up north, pretty significant impacts from the ice and the, and the impacts there. And so first off, recognize that a lot of people had a lot of complicated and difficult times during that, that latter storm. However, that being said, looking at how the grid itself operated during those two storms, the grid itself actually operated as we wanted it to, and it operated very well. Uh, we were able to keep supply operating at the high level generation and transmission level consistently through both of those storms. In the very first one, Winter Storm Elliott, the one that got very, very cold, we set two new winter peaks during that storm. I saw you had a slide on, uh, on Rudy's slide earlier, the San Antonio CPS peak is around five, five and a half uh, uh, gigawatts. Uh, and during the winter storm, we set a new winter peak at 74 gigawatts across the state of Texas. And so San Antonio is not a small city. They use a lot of electricity. But across the state, 74,000 megawatts or 74 gigawatts was that peak. And uh, that was uh, significant. But the grid held up very well, performed very well. We had adequate uh, backup resources throughout. And what, what's really enabled that to, to, your, to the start of your question is a couple of key things that happened after Winter Storm Uri. One was a weatherization program. So right now, as a result of that, Texas generators, as well as Texas transmission companies, are required to weatherize their facilities to be able to withstand extreme cold as well as extreme heat. So it's not just for the winter, but it's also for the summer. And those policies came into play right after the last legislative session. Uh, there was a couple of Senate bills that came out that created that foundation. And immediately, uh, the legislation went into effect. The PUC rules followed. And the weatherization this last winter uh, was applied from those rules. And as a result, we saw during a very extreme cold event, great performance on the grid as a result of that. And let me contrast that with what's happened in the rest of the country during that, that winter event. Because the rest of the country recognized that, you know, that there are needs for winterization as well. When they saw what happened during Winter Storm Uri, they, the rest of the country's policymakers started working on weatherization requirements. Well, the, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission works with an organization called NERC. They apply all the, the standards for reliability for the rest of the country. They just passed this, this last couple months the rules around weatherization for the rest of the US. And they don't go into effect until 2027, to give you perspective. So this storm that happened here, Winter Storm Uri, happened in 2021. The weatherization rules were effect in 2022. And the second phase of those, making them even more stringent, go into effect this coming winter in 2023. So think about the speed of change that that meant and how quickly the electric system here in Texas responded to that and the benefit we saw from that. And during Winter Storm Elliott in the rest of the country, there were rolling blackouts that occurred throughout the East Coast and throughout the Midwest as a result of significant weatherization issues that happened in the rest of the country. So that's one of the benefits of having this island of a Texas grid and the ability to make policy very quickly. And a couple other things that we did that were important, we passed the ability to require or to purchase firm fuel so that a generator would have firm fuel on site available to use so that in case the, the fuel supply was interrupted, the natural gas system or even the coal supply system was interrupted, we would have at least some generation that we could rely on to activate their local firm fuel. And so that change was put into effect. And we used that firm fuel product a couple of times uh, both in, in both of the storms that, that just occurred. And then I, I'd add one more thing is that We've done a much better job of communicating across the electric industry, the gas industry, as well as state policymakers. 
And we have regular phone calls that occur across those segments when we get into an event or the planning for an event to make sure everybody has the resources that they need, they understand where the risks and the potential issues could be, and in real time we're able to connect to each other and ensure that everybody has the kind of information that they need in order to keep the system operating reliably. Uh, we, I had conversations with Rudy during Winter Storm Elliott where we were talking about specific facilities and what was going to, you know, what we could expect to happen out of some of the facilities here in San Antonio so that when our, we were planning the broader, you know, impacts of certain facilities that were coming in and out of service, we knew how you all were going to be able to help support the broader grid. And that kind of communication that we now do regularly across the board has made a, made a big difference in terms of the smoothness of operating the grid. Good. Uh, Rudy, talk to us at the local level, you know, some of those infrastructure enhancements that have been made to repair for some of these extreme weather events. Well, let me start by saying that um, as a result of Pablo's leadership, the, the kind of the insulation that we used to expect out of ERCOT has really changed. If you go to, everybody ought to have, or anybody who's interested, I guess, uh, ought to have the ERCOT app downloaded to your phone. You can go at any point in time onto that ERCOT app and tell how much wind, how much solar, what the, what the resource mix look, looks like and how it changes over time. You can tell what the wholesale price of power is, which drives retail prices in the state of Texas. Uh, you know, as Pablo mentioned, the, the communication uh, that we see from ERCOT and the fact that, you know, our VP of corporate communication, Melissa, she's on with her peers, you know, at ERCOT and we're all talking about uh, the challenge, you know, the, the situation uh, in the moment uh, so that we, we know what the message is and our message here in San Antonio is consistent with what you're going to hear uh, out of Pablo and his folks. Uh, and, and, and I'll take it a step further. Uh, Pablo mentioned it, but I want to punctuate it. During Winter Storm Elliot, the first call I got the following morning that that cold snap came in was from this, from this man. And Pablo was calling, asking if we had what we needed, checking on our, on our resource. That has never happened uh, in, in the history of the time that I have been uh, you know, in a leadership role in this industry that you've got the CEO of ERCOT calling to check on his operators. That's a, a phenomenal change in approach uh, and, and one that I think is going to pay dividends for the state uh, over the long term. Locally, I will tell you that our plans performed well. Now, I'll, I'll tell you from a policy standpoint, we still have work to do uh, making sure that the, the value chain of, of natural gas supply that runs you know, about 40% of our capacity here in San Antonio, that the gas shows up when we need it. And we did see some challenges during both winter storm events, quite frankly, uh, where we saw some, uh, some, some reduction in the gas supply we needed to run our power plants. So I think the, still, the state still has some work to do uh, when it comes to how they ensure that uh, our gas suppliers are held to account for the role they play uh, in our value chain. But I will tell you, ERCOT's paying attention uh, to that too and working with uh, the Public Utility Commission uh, to make sure that, that the Railroad Commission is doing their job to, to regulate that aspect uh, of, the, uh, of the supply chain for, you know, for the electric industry. Here locally, um, we're, we're on, the, on the opposite end of that. So we do the weatherization, and then we have to, to be accountable to ERCOT and the Public Utility Commission to actually come out and inspect our power plants to ensure that we've done the things that we said that we needed to do to, to make sure our power plants are running. We're paying attention to the maintenance schedule. So, you know, you don't have what happened during URI, you know, should never happen again, and that you had 20,000 megawatts of, uh, of, of, of proactive maintenance being done on power plants all at the same time. Now, ERCOT's paying attention to, uh, as are we, paying attention to the forecast. And we're, they're ensuring that you don't have too, mit, too much resources off at any one given time that's going to put us back uh, into that situation. We are communicating locally. Who here gets uh, our text messages or emails anytime in advance of a, a weather event coming in? You have no idea how much positive feedback I get from uh, our community. You know, I'll get a call from... You know, Manny Palias' mom, you know, Mijito, thank you. I was at HEB, uh, you know, and, and, and the rain was coming in, so it gave me a chance to get home. Uh, our customers really love the fact that we're trying 
to, to give them an opportunity to make decisions about what they're going to do. Pablo and I were talking about this uh, before, before the, the program started. Customers don't get upset that they're out. I, I very rarely had a customer call me just because they're upset that they're out. They're, they get upset when they're out and they don't know how long they're going to be out or they don't know what the cause of the outage was, or they don't know, they, they, you know, they can go to a friend's house or a family member's house or go to the grocery store for a couple of hours. If we tell them, give them information that, that allows them to make decisions about what they're gonna do, then they're, they're typically okay with the outage. They know th those things are gonna happen. Um, so I think as collectively, here at CPS Energy, and I, th I think collectively across the state, we are trying really, really hard to, to put information in the hands of the customers so they can make decisions about, um, you know, about their own, their own, their own well-being. I yeah, appreciate that, Rudy. I mean, communication is just vital. It's essential in your line of business. And, and there was obviously some deficiencies in the past that it seems like, based on that anecdote, have been remedied. And so are you doing that with counterparts like Rudy's across state? Talk to about some of the other communication efforts you're doing. Pablo with ERCOT. Yeah, that, it's uh, it's really been what I'd say when I look when I look back at and um, you know I, I looked at what happened at, at Winter Storm Uri a couple of years ago from afar. I was up in uh, the Midwest at the time, but being in the industry, we really was very interested in understanding what happened and and the communication side of uh, of that storm was was really very challenged. And so one of the things that I focused on coming into the organization was really building up and supporting and bolstering our communication team. We had a really strong new team that uh, had been on the ground for about a year when I got here and, um, and wanted to continue to build the support there and the capabilities. And so I've been bringing in resources, experienced resources from the industry as well as from our, uh, our public uh, service uh, arena, folks that really understand what you all are looking for in terms of communications and what you expect. And, uh, and we're, we're adding to our website, as, as Rudy mentioned, we've got an app and a website where you can get a, a lot of information out there. Like I wake up every morning and I turn on, uh, I've got a, a little dashboard that's uh, available that tells me kind of the state of the grid. And it's a really cool looking, very technical dashboard. It took me about you know, two hours to actually learn what's actually on it. But, uh, but now that now I see it, and we make parts of that available now to you. And one of those is a six day forecast. So you can look ahead for the next six days and actually understand kind of what the expectation is in terms of the demand of electricity and the supply of electricity. Um, and when you see, you know, your demand line getting close to your supply line, you know, oh, those are gonna be, you know, those days that are a little bit tighter and you might start getting, you know, messages from your utility company saying, hey, if conservation is appropriate, you know, this would be the time to think about it. But we give that kind of visibility now to everybody and it's in real time and it gets updated in real time. A lot of folks are often interested in understanding how are we operating the grid today? Are we using a lot of wind? Are we using solar? What's the role of natural gas and nuclear and coal? And so we give that information in real time. And so that fuel mix dashboard was published last December and it's been one of our most popular new dashboards that we put out there because people can now really get a sense for understanding, you know, what's actually powering the electric grid and what are we using? And, and it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. I mean, the, the grid that we, that we power here it, it uses more electricity than the state of California and New York combined. I don't know if people have that perspective, just how much energy Texas uses, more than those two states combined at our peaks. And so, and, and we also are now the leader in renewable energy across the United States. When you combine our wind and our solar capabilities, we are the biggest leader in renewable energy in the US and we're growing as one of the biggest in the world. The world is looking at what Texas is doing and how it's managing this transition of integrating renewable energy into a, a, a traditional thermal type of electric grid. And there's a lot of unique challenges with that and we're, we're forging new ground there. And, and so we're trying to communicate how that transition is happening, what's going on with the grid, the impact to the markets. And that, that leads into a lot of the conversations that are going on at the legislature right now. And we're trying to do as good a job as we can helping to keep informed what the important issues are that are at stake at the legislature and why it's important to pay attention to those. Uh, and I know we'll get into that too, but uh, communications is such a critical part of what we're trying to improve, be more transparent with, and we'll always welcome feedback. Feedback from all of our customers as well as from our partners and market uh, key market participants like CPS. And so we look forward to continuing to get better on that front. You know, folks don't realize what an impact Texas has uh, in terms of wind production being number one in the entire country. And solar, we're right behind California, but not for long. Not for long. Right we'll on probably pass California by the end of this year. That's right. So with that, let's move over. You know, capacity is a challenge. Let's talk a little bit about supply chain 
um, and all the disruption that we've seen with supply chain, that's got to be a challenge for your business, Rudy, um, as it relates to transformers coming in and, and everything else. Talk to us a little bit about some of those challenges. Well, to all my developers in the room, let me start by just saying I'm sorry uh, for the challenges that we've had with our uh, transformers and meter bases, wire, uh, poles. We, we literally, we're having challenges in, in every respect with respect to our supply chain, Ch transformers being uh, the, the most significant disruption. Uh, and we, we're kicking over every rock trying to find a transformer underneath it uh, right now, really across the world, um, outside of maybe China and some, some places that uh, we typically don't procure um, you know, uh, supplies from. But you know, we're sending people down to Mexico uh, you know, looking for manufacturers who can build transformers for us. Right now, we're about 3,000 transformers behind. Um, you know, I think this is a uh, phenomenon that's going to probably persist for the next few years. Uh, but I do think we're making progress. We've got a couple of big shipments of tra transformers coming in here over the next, uh, you know, 30 to 60 days. Uh, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a challenge for us. Um, you know, we have changed our design standards to be a little more flexible. That's helped a little bit. We're working, we meet weekly with our development community at the, the San Antonio uh, Builders Association and the Real Estate Council uh, to make sure that there's transparency in where you're at in line for your transformers so that uh, developers are making you know, good financial decisions about how far to take their developments um, before they have to kind of stop and wait uh, for their transformers to come in. So uh, we're, I, I can just tell you, we're, we're trying. We've got all the supplies we need to maintain our system uh, you know, for the customers that we have, which is a priority. We don't want to get in a situation where you have an outage and you don't have a transformer to replace the transformer that went out. Um, so we, we have, we've planned for that uh, appropriately, but it's going to affect everything. It will affect how quickly we can get new generation built. You know, we're, right now with the conversation at the legislature is about the need to do something because the clock is ticking. You have to get in line if you're going to build a new gas, you know, t uh, turbine uh, uh, generator for the turbine. And, so, and that may take two or three years. And so the longer, we, the, the longer we take to make decisions about how we're going to solve some of the challenges that we're facing, the more supply chain factors come into play. Uh, and so, so that's an element that I'll just put out there. You know, it's not just about making a decision about what type of generation we're going to build, but you have to place an order to get in line for the generator, you know, to, to be planned for. Uh, and that's something that we need to be paying attention, paying attention to. Paul, let's shift over to grid reliability again and talk a little bit about long-term long -term resource adequacy and how, you know, what are you projecting and, and feeling about that? So, so there's a lot, of, a lot of the conversation that's going on at the legislature right now is, is focused on this and really you know, looking to try to solve what the challenge is with the ERCOT electric market and then you know, how do we address you know, risks in the future. So as we talked about following winter storm Uri, the weatherization work, the firm fuel supply issues, a lot of that really addressed some of the, I'd say the, the biggest contributors to what happened during winter storm Uri and, and the challenges there. However, there's a broader challenge that's out there, and there's a graph I'd like to show that I think is helpful if we can put it up here. This one is uh, a view of um, how demand has changed across the state of Texas since the start of the ERCOT market. So if you go to the left side of this graph, and this is for winter. If you go to the left side of this graph, really that's the start of the ERCOT market. The gray section shows how much thermal dispatchable uh, generating resources were on the grid at that time. So those would be your coal plants, your, your gas plants, your nuclear plants. That's the capacity, generating capacity that exists at the time of the market start. The red line is the demand, the peak demand in each of the years over the last 23 years. So you can see how demand is steadily growing as the economy and the state has grown. The green section is as wind started to become a very big part of the resource mix. You see it's starting to, to come into play there in the mid-2000s and then starting to grow more rapidly. The yellow is the solar resources that are starting to come online. And then the blue is the battery resources, battery storage resources. And so for the first, I'd say, about eight years in the market, we, we saw a lot of new gas generation built. And it was what was, what was driving that was 
the replacement of your old, less efficient steam turbine gas units that were more costly to run, and the market was designed to reward efficient generators. The market was built to really drive efficiency in the Texas market. The whole design was around, let's make this more cost effective, make it highly efficient. It's going to be the world's most efficient electric market. And it succeeded in doing that. And it, it sent signals to basically to the generators to say, hey, you're going to make a lot more money in this market if you retire these older, less efficient gas units and replace them with much more efficient combined cycle units. And so we saw 20,000 megawatts of net new generation built in the first eight years of the market being built. And the market was operating and functioning very well. Then the next 15 years is a very different story. Over the last 15 years, only 1,500, 1,500 megawatts of net new thermal generation has been built. And you look at that and you go, well, well why is that? Well, the, the reason is fairly simple because the way the market is designed, the market incentivizes the lowest cost, most efficient resource on the grid. And as wind started to come into play and solar started to come into play, those resources have a very low variable cost. The variable cost of a generating unit is essentially the cost of its fuel. And the cost of fuel for a wind farm or for a solar facility is zero. And so if you think about that, they can bid into the market their cost of their fuel, which is zero. And so they're always going to get dispatched and be part of the energy mix if they're available, which means that if you only need 50,000 megawatts to serve and you've got half of that being delivered by wind and sun, well, then that kind of pushes out the other, the other facilities, the gas, the coal, the nuclear, that may have a cost, higher cost profile. So all of a sudden, these, these units started getting dispatched less and less and less the more renewables came onto the grid. On top of that, renewable resources get a federal subsidy. That federal subsidy pays them, essentially, to operate. So even if the cost of energy on the grid is almost zero, which some days it is, when it's very moderate, the cost of energy on the grid can be virtually nothing, a renewable facility can still make money through the federal subsidies because they get paid a subsidy just to produce energy. Whether or not it's needed or not, they still get paid. And so that very significant incentive package together created what you're seeing on this graph, which is the growth of renewable energy. During, during those 15 years where we added 1,500 megawatts of thermal generation, we added over 48,000 megawatts of wind and solar. So think about that. And that, so that low cost energy that's sitting on the grid is competing against the other resources. And so we've seen very new, very, very low amounts of, of uh, new gas generation being built. And so what we're trying to figure out what to do is how to fix that issue with the market redesign. And as you see, as, uh, in terms of why, why we think that this is a very pressing and a very significant issue, that red line in this graph, it first peaks above that, dispat that gray line in 2022. And what that little peak was, that's Winter Storm Elliott. So we hit that, that peak in the winter. For the first time, we, are, we, are, we were above what was available in terms of installed thermal dispatchable energy. And if you switch to the next slide, it shows you a view in the summertime. You can see what the summer picture looks like. And that margin between the red line and the gray, which is the, you know, the, 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 the generating resources with an on and off switch. It's a simple way to think about them. It's getting narrower and narrower. That cushion of dispatchable generation, we call that, is getting much smaller. And so we need to figure out how to build that cushion back up. Because when the, when the wind isn't blowing, when the sun isn't shining, and when it's very hot or very cold, everybody still expects the electricity to work. And we're now getting to a place where if we find a coincident period where there's very low wind, very low sun, and very high demand, you can see by this picture, we could be in a place where we run out of enough electricity. And that's a very serious issue. And so we have to figure out how to restructure the market to re-incentivize building that kind of dispatchable generation with an on switch so that we can use that whenever is necessary. That's the long-term resource adequacy issue that, that exists in Texas today. That's what we're working through with the legislature collectively as well as with the market participants collectively to try to find what's the right way to do that in order to ensure continued reliability and low cost energy for Texas going forward. You know, there was some significant scrutiny at the time when Euro was going on and how close we got to you know, total failure, and there were some unsung heroes, really, that were part of ERCOT that were involved with making some really tough decisions at that time uh, as well. Uh, but uh, let's talk a little bit about this, the uh, Sarah report that you put out seasonally. 
you know, here in San Antonio, we, we consider Sarah the San Antonio River Authority. This is a little bit different <laughs> from that. So talk to us about what you mean. It's a little different, but I'm sure uh, <laughs> equally as important. Uh, our Sarah report is the seasonal assessment of resource adequacy. We put this out every season, every, every quarter. And uh, what it does is it looks ahead to the next three months and it says, here's what we expect in terms of the demand. Here's what's changed in terms of the available generating resources and what's, what we expect in terms of the growth of energy use because consistently Texas is growing year over year, quarter over quarter. We, we effectively add the equivalent at the state of Texas of a city the size of Corpus Christi every single year. And so if you think about the number of people that that represents, the businesses, the energy consumption, and then you add to that the general trend of electrification, people driving more electric vehicles, people building their housing stock with more electric infrastructure, the growth in energy demand continues to grow at a very aggressive pace. Plus the business growth in Texas is you know, far surpassing most of the rest of the country. So all of that combines to create a very you know, dynamic uh, profile of what's happening season to season and year to year. And so we put out this Sarah report to help the state understand kind of what the profile looks like and where the risks are. It's really a risk assessment. And what we do is we run essentially what it's called a Monte Carlo scenario analysis where we'll run thousands of scenarios of weather permutations and uh, wind availability, solar availability, uh, outages on generating resources, all these different parameters and say, what are the likelihoods that we'll get to a scenario where we won't have enough uh, electric supply? And what those reports are revealing over time is that the probabilities are going up each year that we're gonna have a scenario where we won't have enough electric supply. And so we need to do something about it. It's, it's reinforcing and reaffirming what we see on a slide like this, which is really a very simple view that shows what demand is over the course of time and how our generating mix has changed. But this Sarah report tells you probabilistically what are the likelihoods of there being a scenario where something may go wrong? And so it, again, it reinforces, we need to do something today. The time to act is today. It takes time to build resources, to build generating units. And so we have to do something about that quickly. Great. Rudy, you got aging plants in your fleet and uh, your chair, Martinez Gonzalez and Vice Chair Romero just approved along with the board a, a plan to get to through 2030 with new uh, opportunities. Talk to us a little bit about some of the facilities that are in, you're projecting for going forward in the future. Well, CPS Energy is very much trying to think about the world from, you know, kind of all options on the table perspective. You know, there, there is no wrong resource answer. And that's what I, I keep talking to our legislators about, you know, who might be interested in creating, you know, disincentives for renewables. You don't have to disincentivize renewables to incentivize thermal generation, as Pablo mentioned. We need every resource available to us. You know, I, I, I'm proud of the work we've done with uh, the San Antonio water system because, you know, to create resiliency for what is critical infrastructure for them, we've also created 50 megawatts of additional, you know, thermal generation that we'll be able to sell into the ERCOT market when, you know, market conditions uh, warrant it. Uh, we're, you know, yeah, we're looking at, at, at additional solar because our community demands it, but we're also looking at putting battery storage to make that solar more valuable when, you know, we need it to extend the peaks into the peak. There's other types of baseload generation that Texas hasn't spent much time trying to develop, such as geothermal, for instance. We're, you know, we're working on a geothermal project because we're actually on a geothermal seam that runs right through, you know, right around the Calaveras Lake area, which we're perfectly situated. So maybe we do move, move away. From, so geothermal is using the, the heat and cooling capabilities of, of the earth uh, to be able to run a, basically run a turbine. So you pump fluids down into the earth to cool them off and you bring them back up and you heat them up by running them through uh, a generator and then you run them back through to, to cool them down again. That you can run uh, a geothermal plant the same way you run a, a gas plant or a nuclear plant or a coal plant. Uh, and if we do it on site uh, where a, a former coal plant used to be, there's federal dollars that can help us, you know, buy that cost down uh, to make it competitive with, with the market. So, um, you know, and, you know, one thing that the state has finally come around on uh, is the value of demand response. We have the most successful demand response program in the state of Texas right here in San Antonio. About 200 megawatts, give or take. Our customers are able to turn their switch off and put that power 
you know, ba basically lower the amount of capacity we need in that moment. We pay them for that. It's just like a generator. Uh, you know, we've been talking about virtual power plants in San Antonio for 10 years since the STEP program uh, was created. Now you're hearing that VPP term used all over the state. And what it reflects is how you basically create power capacity by taking load, you know, off, offline when you need it. So, so we're going to, so our, our strategy really is we want to be able to monetize any type of generation that we can, we can affordably build for our customers. Uh, and so, so we want all of our assets to be part of ERCOT's mix. We want to take our old gas assets off. We have a, you know, a number of, of, of old steam turbines that uh, gas generated uh, that we need to get offline. They're 50 years old. You know, when ERCOT calls on them, you know, I mean, sometimes you got to hold your breath on whether they're going to come on or not because they're 50 years old. Uh, and so, and ERCOT has got to hold, hold their breath. And guess what? There's plants like that all over the state of Texas that we got to get out of the system and get some new, uh, some new capacity to replace those so that we can rely on them. So the resources that we're investing in that, that, that was thoughtfully considered as part of our, of our rate advisory committee review that, that our chair Reed Williams, you know, led a very difficult process that our board has now uh, uh, sanctioned us to go out and execute upon really is to ensure that, you know, we're making thoughtful and affordable investment decisions, but that we're considering everything that's available to us. You know, we're not going to overinvest in one type of generation or another. We're going to need to continue to, to execute a, diversi a diversified strategy so that when policymakers make decisions about the future, that we're, we're positioned in any direction that they move. That's our goal. Excellent. You know, we've got uh, 10 million more people that are going to be moving here by 2036. And uh, they're not bringing energy with them or water or broadband or <laughs> infrastructure with them. Um, and I was also really shocked to understand how Bitcoin mining, for instance, places an amazing strain uh, on the grid. And there's probably a, a whole host of other items that do the same. Talk to us how we're preparing for that population growth and those kinds of heavy users as well. Yeah, there, there's some, the, the change in the electric market is really, it's, it's phenomenal how fast it's changing. And uh, customers like crypto miners, Bitcoin miners, are a unique uh, type of a customer. They can set up and create a, a full business um, and have it up and running in a matter of months. And they can be 50, 100, 500 megawatts of use, which when you think about that, that's bigger than a lot of the municipalities and, and rural communities across the state of Texas, it, like by a magnitude of 10. I mean, so all of a sudden you can have these things pop up and demand uh, electricity. And so we are working very closely with them as well as with other large, we call them large flexible loads, to try to find a way to work together to help manage and balance the grid. Because there there's, can be value, as, and as Rudy defined, demand response is just as good as generation in, in, the, in the moment. Because if you can turn off your demand, that's the same as turning on supply. And so it, it has the same effect. And so a large user like a crypto miner, if it's integrated with and communicating with ERCOT, we can work together and say, hey, I need you to turn off right now because demand is getting very high, supply is coming in short, and we need you to, to, to curtail. The good news is that business model tends to work well with that kind of incentive because when the cost of energy is high, it's not a good time to mine for Bitcoin. You don't make money. And so it, the, the business model works well. But across the board, we're working with, we've created a task force that is uh, oriented to figuring out the best way to integrate these types of resources because it's, it's really the, the Texas business environment that's so conducive to businesses moving here that is bringing a lot of these kinds of industries that are energy intensive because we've got a great supply of energy and a good cost for it here. But we need to figure out how to work together and, co and collaborate and communicate effectively to manage the, the reliability. Fantastic. Let, well, let me just add on yes. that. Uh, Kaufman needs to be doing, not doing such a good job of attracting <laughs> uh, those type of businesses to San Antonio because we got 20 of those suckers in the queue right now, uh, right here in San Antonio. San Antonio is a very desirable place for data center type customers to be, uh, and we're glad to have them. It drives revenue. It's good, you know, for, for the, our revenue. It's good for the return we send back to the city, but they're huge loads, and you have to plan for those differently than just the normal customer. 
Um, so it, it certainly, you know, I, I just, I just want to, you know, underscore the fact that that's an, that is something we're paying attention to right here in San Antonio. And I understand we've got some questions from the audience that are going to be brought up here on the screen that I can read out. Um, if that's the case, we'd love to see those. And uh, we'll take those questions now. In the meantime, while we're waiting for that to kind of be brought up, uh, Rudy, talk to us a little about the performance uh, credit mechanism. You know, how, how does that work here in San Antonio? So I, I've been talking a lot about um, the need for something to, to be done. Um, you know, I, I know what my answer is. I'll, 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 I'll invite Pablo to, to weigh in. Um, do we have a capa capacity issue in Texas? The answer that I think Pablo just answered a little while ago is yes, we do. Um, the, per the performance credit mechanism, the PCM uh, proposal that the Public Utility Commission has put out there was originally intended to just be a framework. You have to have a starting point in a conversation, and the PUC bit the bullet, and they put something out there. Now, is it the, is, is there, are there enough specifics about how it would work uh, to know whether you support it or don't support it? Not yet, but I think they'll continue to work through that. Um, do, 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 do I think that uh, it's a framework work that could work? Yeah, I think it's a framework that can work once we decide what and, and really uh, uh, factor in how, what the cost to the customer is, right? It's gonna, there is no free, there is no free lunch. There is no free lunch in the world of trying to create capacity. And there's only one place to go for those resources, and that's our customer. So we have to, is it a $500 million cost or is it a $5 billion cost? That's a pretty big you know, range there that we have to pay some attention to. Will it create the incentive for generation, new uh, uh, gas generation to come online? Because you're not going to build nuclear. It's too expensive. And you can't build coal because nobody's going to take, take the risk anymore. So it's going to be gas, it, you know, for whatever amount is built. But will the proposal actually create the incentive that will create new, new generation? We're not sure yet. So I think those are the conversations that are going to be happening at the legislature. We're fully engaged uh, in the conversation. I do think that the state has a role to play in how new generation is incentivized, but at what cost? And what does that do to affordability in San Antonio? Uh, because I know it'll have an impact in the competitive market, but I'm interested in what impact, you know, those are regulatory fees that we pass on anytime there's, a, there's new charges that, that uh, come into to the picture. So we have, we have to pay attention to that. That is our role at CPS Energy to, to be watching out for our customer. If I could just add on a, a little bit um, to, to kind of maybe set a little context of, of the, what the performance credit kind of mechanism is and, and what it means in the ERCOT market. So the Texas market, is a little different than every other market in the country. I already talked about how it's an island, so that's unique. But it's also unique in terms of its uh, the key parts to it. There's an energy market, which essentially is the buying and selling and the, of, of energy that happens every day, real time. Every market has that. So every, every market in the US has an energy market. They also, every market has an ancillary services market. That's essentially kind of the reserves that we, we buy every day just in case uh, a power plant trips offline, or just in case a weather forecast comes in very differently, we have these reserves in order to make sure that we operate the market reliably all, all the time, every day, 24-7, you know, 365 days a year. So every market in the country has an ancillary service market. You need those two in, to in order to operate a real-time market. The one thing that we don't have is something that every other market does have, and that's uh, every other market has a capacity market. So the capacity market is essentially a market that is designed to send price signals to the generators in those areas if you start to get short on enough capacity to serve the, the energy needs of that area. That capacity market is a separate revenue stream that generators can avail themselves of, and it's what's intended to drive long-term resource adequacy in other markets. Texas doesn't have that. We only have the two parts. We have energy and we have ancillary services. And as you can see, over time, what's happened because of the change of the resource mix and the way the market has been designed, we have lost the growth in that dispatchable energy mix. And so this performance credit mechanism that Rudy described, that's intending to bring that third leg of the stool to the Texas market. It's not the same as what the rest of the country has. It's not a capacity market. It's a performance market. And it's designed to pay generators that can perform during specific hours when the energy is needed most. When we have the lowest availability of renewables, 
the highest demand uh, at that point in time when you really need those generators with an on and off switch. It incentivizes and pays them to perform during those hours of the year. And that revenue stream creates a long-term signal that a generator could build and plan a power plant with. And so that's the idea behind this PCM is to create that third leg, create that planable revenue stream so that long-term we can shore up that closing gap, that, that shrinking cushion that we have and make sure that we always have reliable generation. So that's the reason and that's what that performance market is. Thank you very much. Listen, it's one o'clock. Uh, I think I hear Joe Cryer's uh, alarm going off or Dwayne's <laughs> meetings that start on time, end on time. So I'm gonna abide by that. And I wanna thank uh, our panel very much and ask uh, Joe to come up and conclude our event. Can we give him a round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you so much, AJ, Pablo, Rudy. Thank you all for your leadership and uh, we appreciate you participating in the North Chamber program today. Round of applause for our panelists. Don't go, I think we're gonna need a picture up here before we go. Uh, for everybody else, our guests, thank you for being here. For our sponsors, thank you for making this event possible. And we look forward to seeing all of you at our next North San Antonio Chamber event. So our meeting's adjourned, thank you. Thank you, excellent. excellent. Well moderated.